Welcome back to the Marvel Movie Minute, a daily podcast in which we dig in deep to analyze the films of the Marvel Cinematic Universe one minute at a time. I'm Andy Nelson from TheNextReel.com. And I'm Pete Wright, also from The Next Reel. We're at the beginning of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, looking at Jon Favreau's 2008 film, Iron Man. And back with us today, we have Rick and Julia Ingham from the Mad Max Minute. Welcome back. Hello. So glad to be here. Yes, hello. We are ready for this minute to lift us higher than we've ever been lifted before. (laughs) (laughs) I feel like there's an 80s song in there. That feels really, really 80s. (laughs) Uh, on today's show, we're looking at Iron Man Minute 109. The minute starts with Iron Monger in hot pursuit of Iron Man, and it ends with Iron Man slowly falling from the sky. So as it turns out, it, it really, I mean, this Iron Monger suit does not take off quickly. But as we learn pretty early on in this minute, he can actually go faster than Tony, at least when Tony is running low on power. Yeah, it must be because Tony doesn't have enough power. Because otherwise, that would be a bit unbelievable to me. When when Tony had his uh, his other uh, chest piece in that currently is in the Ironmonger suit, we saw him fly uh, faster than uh, than uh, Mach One as he was uh, racing across the skies, going through Afghanistan and uh, r- avoiding the the jets that were in pursuit of him. Here he goes. If it's really hard to see on his very shaky HUD when when we do get a chance to look at it, but he the moment that we do get to see it, he goes from about 0.85 uh, Mach 0.85 to Mach 0.9, and so that means he's flying about 650 miles per hour, and he gets to about 690 in that uh, moment. So he's flying pretty fast, and Obadiah is still flying faster than him. But it clearly hasn't uh, hasn't hit Mach because we haven't uh, we haven't had that point where he uh, uh, kind of uh, we get that great moment earlier when when uh, Tony breaks the sound barrier and and uh, and has that fantastic moment. We don't have that from Obadiah here, but we do get some incredible looming work done here mm-hmm. in, in flight. That sequence right after we have Tony talking about power uh, in the HUD, then at about. 10, 11 seconds, we have this like four second slow, slow creep up of Ironmonger into the frame. And uh, he's just incredibly menacing. And what a handy and useful, uh, you know, visual trick to make him look so large while we're flying so high over the city. I think it's a it's it's a really neat uh, visual as he's icing up. Yeah, exactly. It starts to show the icing that is creeping in around like he's not completely iced up at this point right but we start to see exactly why tony is bringing him up so high we do that it's it turns out it was all a ruse you guys a clever <laughs> ruse uh, and, and then we get tony's right this is these are this is the handicap a handicapping shot right so we see the ice on ironmonger and then we do tony's and it goes down to the to the flickering chest piece right the flickering power indicator uh on tony's suit so um you know who whose is the worst handicap time will tell and i will say uh, just as another note to great shots that we've been pointing out when you have that fantastic shot of the two of them just kind of rocketing across the sky and we're like you know, a, a ways away from them, and you just see the 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 all of the city and everything just blurring past them as these two rockets are basically shooting into the sky. It's a great shot. I just love the look of that. Followed by another great shot of Iron Man flying like right up toward and past the camera, and then Iron Monger like reaching up to grab him, and the amount of smoke billowing behind him is just. I mean, it's like. It, He's creating a giant thundercloud behind him is what it looks right. like. There's so much <laughs> smoke coming out from behind him. It's, it just is amazing to look at. That's the stealth cloud, Andy. That's the stealth <laughs> secret cloud. Right. If you can't see through the cloud, then they can't technically see you. That's right. That's how it works, right? That's how it works. <laughs> it's totally planned. We totally meant to do that. <laughs> 
the uh, it, it, the whole moment, I, I think it just works so nicely. We brought up the whole setup and payoff thing in the last minute about Terrence Howard saying the whole training exercises. We've got the great uh, setup and payoff of the icing problem here and, and that whole issue of how it works. And it's great when we finally have uh, Ironmonger catch Tony in the sky and start pummeling him and he wraps his hands around his throat and starts crushing him. And uh, they have, a, you know, the great villain and hero line exchange up there in, uh, I don't know where they are, like 80,000 feet up in the air at this point. And uh, Tony just has that great line. How'd you solve the icing problem? <laughs> icing problem? <laughs> now, are they talking over radio? That's something that I've been uh, asking myself quite a bit because uh, we had earlier when Tony comes flying in before he starts pummeling Ironmonger, he screams, hey... But everybody hears it. So I think that there must be elements that these suits have where there's internal conversation, like when he's talking to Jarvis, that's not projected out through speakers. But I think some of it must be like they are projecting it through speakers. Now, I don't know if these guys are communicating through radio or if it's just speakers that are really loud. I don't know. I'm, I'm really curious about that. And I bring it up because not only are they incredibly high in the atmosphere where air is very thin, but you've also got to think that Obadiah is still rocketing skyward. He hasn't slowed down just because he caught up to Tony. And so it's essentially a reverse point break moment where instead of them falling and carrying on a conversation, they're rocketing upward and carrying on a conversation. <laughs> Right. Over the sound of rockets. But, you know, I have an answer for that. I think their headphones in their helmets are noise canceling. Oh, OK. It's their bows. <laughs> it's branded, it's I mean, branded <laughs> helmet equipment. These are really advanced suits. And if you're so going advanced. to put headsets in the helmet, you're going to go for the best. You better go with the noise canceling. It needs to work flying, rocketing towards space and uh, on a busy airplane. Well, it's a shame they didn't work out that uh, product placement agreement so that they could have had <laughs> bows stamped on the side of his head. <laughs> More logos. That's what this movie needs. <laughs> we need to turn Ironmonger into a stock car from just NASCAR racing. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Just more stickers. Oh, I love that. That would work really well in Iron Man 2 when, yes. he's, uh, <laughs> when yes. he's at the track. Uh, in Monaco, that would be great. Uh, we so this great moment. I think it's it's that perfect payoff, and I love the shot of Jeff Bridges. And you know, again, I think this, considering you guys love the the having the dude in here, I think this is the first time that you guys have gotten a chance to see Jeff Bridges in our minute so far, where you get him uh, seen through his HUD as the power kind of fails, and it, it is a moment of panic on Obadiah's face. I like this little shot we have of him. I do like being able to see him. I appreciate more in minutes that we aren't going to be here for the way that Obadiah opens up in order to taunt Tony. But here in this minute, you can see that he's got this look on his face of like, oh, no, icing problem. And then the shot doesn't linger long enough for him to change his expression once the lights all go away. But you can almost imagine that as they cut to the outside of that helmet with those lights going dark, that he just gets a classic oh no expression all over his face. Yeah, it's the, <laughs> the in-helmet zoinks, right? <laughs> I regret that we don't actually get that shot. I like that we get a moment of rehumanizing Obadiah. He's been locked in this suit for the last several minutes doing atrocious things to both Tony and the general public. And now that his life is genuinely in danger, we get to see his face again. Yeah, that's a good point. It works really nicely. And it ends up having a, a very kind of comical payoff, too, when we come back, <laughs> we come back to Tony as, uh, as uh, we've seen the Ironmonger's eyes flicker and power down. And then Tony just kind of bonks him on the head <laughs> shatters some ice as he starts plummeting toward the ground yeah what what is that is that that's a weird power move right that weird little childlike <laughs> bonk on the head yeah, like, like a, a little, little bunny foo-foo little, little, little bunny foo-foo that's what i was trying to think of yes the little bunny foo-foo move and i love the 
sound effect that they have of Iron Man's gauntlet hitting the top of that helmet because it does give like a little bonk, uh, like a nice, <laughs> not quite bell ring to it, but something that's not quite as hollow as knocking on like a car or something like that. It's solid. Yeah. Yeah. It feels very solid. And it's, it's, it is really satisfying. I, I have to say watching the ice shatter as the, uh, as the ironmonger just kind of falls. And then you get the fantastic piece of music that kind of that power music that we have for, for Iron Man that just kind of swells right there too. As, as we kind of see that fall and we see Iron Man flying up there right next to the moon, which is, it, it just is, it's beautiful. I mean, it's this great hero shot and it it, for me it's reminiscent of tim burton's 89 batman when you have the Mm. bat wing kind of fly up to the moon but then what favreau does which he does so often is he takes these these amazingly cool hero moments and he humanizes it in a really funny way where we've got this this heroic shot iron man in the moon as he's flying there and then his power goes out and he falls out of frame. I love it. it like he falls <laughs> the way he falls. It's like he's losing balance, like he's walking on a tight wire, you know, and, and suddenly his arms, he's just kind of trying to catch his balance, but he's floating in midair. That that whole bit of physical comedy, I think, just works really well for me. It, it's akin to the coyote running off a cliff. Right. And and he's it's the it's the wily coyote thing. I just I find it so funny. And I especially like how Jarvis telegraphs it. Like Iron Man is floating there in his triumph and then Jarvis pipes up because he was told earlier, stop telling me. But Jarvis can't help but say, oh, two (laughs) percent. He just had to pipe in, didn't he? (laughs) And it's during this fall that we go from two percent down to emergency backup power. Right, which we'll we'll find out more. But I mean, we we're talking about the power situation. So as he's been fighting, he went from what was it, nineteen percent, I believe, that we were at earlier uh, when we were chatting, and yep. then he was started flying, and he was about at thirteen, and then eleven, and his, his seven, and I mean, power just kept kind of depleting until finally two percent, and yeah, he's just not doing very well anymore. Yeah, if we've seen everything in real time, we've gone a full. 20% of his total power in only two minutes. I mean, okay. Uh, to that end, he's been using his, like his unibeam blasting out of his chest. He's been using it more as a, as a weapon. So he's been kind of doing a lot of fighting, not so much just the flying that he was doing initially. Although again, 30% when he flew from his house to, uh, to Stark Industries, that does seem like a big drop just for that flight it does but you uh, like this is this goes back to the rt stuff that i don't understand right the rt as a power device so if only i I think you said something that alluded to if only he had a a little bit of break he would be able to recharge this thing but that's part of the fight he hasn't had a a break he hasn't had a time to stand still is that what you were meaning Right, exactly. Like this has been constant. I mean, the whole idea, I guess, of this arc reactor technology is that it's this power that just kind of, you know, is constant and and it's this never ending source of power, but it does drain. And this initial one that he built in the cave, as Julia pointed out in her earlier in our conversation, he said, you know, it can power something really big for 15 minutes. It's not as strong as the one that he uh, subsequently built that uh, that Obadiah stole from him and is now right, in right, the right. Ironmonger suit. So yeah, he doesn't have that much power, and he used a lot of it in his flight, and now he's been using the bulk of it in in his uh, this fight that he's doing. But I guess that was my question: Is this a question of capacity or rate of rate of expense of power? Right, that the it's not like a battery. It will eventually sort of if if he was trying to power something that that called for less, it would last theoretically forever or is this a thing that eventually like at the end of this will he will it just be dead it'll be the light will turn off supposedly it keeps rejuvenating itself but it takes it takes that rest time yeah um that's my understanding of it and i mean because that's why 
I mean, he depleted it when he escaped Afghanistan. Remember, he's flying yeah. and then he runs out and falls into the sand. And but then, uh, but then he puts it in the little glowing. glass vessel and it's yeah, still it's, going. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Right. So it keeps kind of that power regenerating. It's just when you're really using it. And I, I'm assuming that that unibeam blast probably sucked up quite a bit of the, mm-hmm. what was what was left. Yeah. Yeah. It's a tricky thing. Iron Man has built himself an Energizer bunny, but you can only push the Energizer bunny so far. He's reaching the end of the metaphorical table and he's going to have to turn Mm -hmm. around at some point. Right. Yeah. What I do like about all of this, um, the stuff going on with his power, this is something that he ran into quite a bit in the comics. And so to that end, it feels very much like that Iron Man suit from the comics. Although in the comics, he had to go plug himself in, in like in the middle of a fight, he had to find a place to hide to plug in so that he could jet, get his juices <laughs> back up. <laughs> oh, <laughs> the good old days, right? Oh, I can only imagine Iron Man in the middle of this fight, and then he's got to try and find an outlet somewhere. <laughs> Plug well, in. These days, he would just lay down on like a charging plate, right? <laughs> lay down on a cell phone charging plate. Find a trolley line and just kind of grab that yeah. third rail. <laughs> <laughs> right. Just like he's eating the energy. Just a little boost. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you guys, um, what, what's your background with, with Marvel and comic books? Were you guys readers of this or did you just kind of jump into all of this with uh, when the movie started coming out? I'm definitely a, a movie person. I, I have never gotten into comics. I, I grew up in a house full of sisters Ask me about Barbies. I can <laughs> <laughs> I can talk about that, but comics not so much. But I've been a fan of Marvel since Iron Man, since they started. This is the exact sort of movie where it's technologically interesting and it's funny and the performances are crisp and well done. This is the exact sort of movie I like, and Marvel just keeps doing it over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. I was definitely one of those Saturday morning cartoon kids And so my first exposure to Marvel was the X-Men cartoon. And as the popularity of the X-Men cartoon grew, they expanded into other heroes. So my first exposure to Iron Man is actually the Iron Man cartoon where they have this ridiculous opener where it's not quite uh, the Iron Man song from from, uh, Black Sabbath, but it's sort of this oddball change up on the idea and the whole opener is tony having this robot arm assisted forging hammer and every time he brings the hammer down on an anvil the shadow of a different suit pops up on the wall and that was my first exposure so when i heard that they were making an iron man movie that's the iron man that i thought of and so i never got into any of the comics because that would have required an accessible comic book store close by to my house which I either never wanted to invest my allowance money or invest the time in going two towns over to find a shop. So I never got into the paperback aspects to it. I was always the visual media type of kid. So it was an easy jump for me to go from Saturday morning cartoons to movies. And I've stuck with it ever since. Now, were you guys into like when the Spider-Man movies and the X-Men movies were coming out? Were you fans of those ones too? Or did you really jump in with Iron Man? I was totally on board for X-Men and Spider-Man with diminishing returns with each subsequent uh, (laughs) sequel. Uh, I don't think, Julia, I don't think you ever liked the Spider-Man ones just because of Tobey Maguire. I I don't like Spider-Man. Wait, wait, I'm sorry, what? (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's the canned response we usually hear. I'm, I'm not a fan of the character. I uh, the, the 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 snarky teenager thing does nothing for me. Um, I'm not interested in the problems of teenagers. I haven't seen any of the new Spider-Mans, have I? Didn't we watch Homecoming together? I'm pretty sure we did. Oh, what was? That? Oh, it was so good. That was the Home- one with. Um, <laughs> With Michael Keaton as the vulture. Oh, as the, vulture. the vulture. Yeah. Okay, I saw it, but I did not pay attention to the whole thing. Either I fell asleep, <laughs> I was playing on my phone. So I like the new kid. What's his name? Tom Holland. Tom Holland. I like Tom Holland, but I like him in the context of Civil War and 
the the newest Avengers Infinity from last War, year, right. Infinity yeah. War. Thank you. Yeah. And I'm looking forward to him in Endgame. Maybe if that you know <laughs> if, he, if he shows up in Endgame, I'm looking right, forward right. to him there. But his standalone movies, I have no interest in. Uh, Teenagers, just I just don't find them entertaining. I find them <laughs> variously frustrating and stupid or scary. Yeah, and that's a hard one because, you know, Spider-Man, it, being a teenager is central to sort of exactly. canon portrayal of that character. So I can see if, you, if you're not into any of the teen angst, yeah, I can see how that would get in the way of you enjoying this movie. Yeah. Those properties. And so that's why it's easy to watch a movie like Iron Man because he's an adult. He has this adult sort of world that he has to deal with, with Pepper and Obadiah and bringing Happy into the equation and having to constantly dodge Coulson, you know, that sort of thing. Right. It's more uh, engaging for an adult audience. Well, and plus, you know, I I think (laughs) by this time, I mean, it's nice to see how they had found a way to really kind of tell the cinematic story, the entry point that they wanted to so that they could kind of develop it and grow into something more with it. So as we will see, as we continue the series, Mm -hmm. looking forward to it. Well, let's wrap up today's minute. Um, We'll be back uh, one more time with you guys. But uh, until then, would you guys like to tell everybody where they can find you? Certainly. Our main home on the internet is madmaxminute.com. That's where you can find absolutely everything. But if you are the kind of person that likes to hang out on Facebook, you can find our stuff there. Just go into that top search bar, uh, type in Mad Max Minute, and you'll find not only our official page that just has all of our new episodes coming out. It's very official looking. But we also have a side group that is a closed group. It's called Mad Max Minute Beyond Microphone. And we ask one question when you go to join it. It's basically, how did you hear about us? Because I am terribly interested in where people are coming from when they look to join our community. So go on there, click join, tell us where you heard about us, and I'll let you write in. Beyond Microphone is a nice little place. We talk about the episodes. We post memes. Um, I like to say that, you know, Beyond Microphone is simple. There, You can't break the rules because there aren't any. <laughs> Very Thunderdome-esque. So <laughs> we have a lot of fun over there on Facebook. So check us out there if you're that kind of person. Well, and it's good to know that you haven't had, uh, you haven't been in a position yet where you've had to have people face the wheel. So that's, that's important to <laughs> Not know. yet. <laughs> Not yet. All right, everybody. Well, that is it for today's show. Thanks so much for tuning in. Make sure you subscribe to the show for free at marvelmovieminute.com. Join us over in our Discord chat room and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at The Next Reel. And if you like what we do and you want to support us and get some cool stuff, become a patron over at thenextreel.com slash Patreon. Until next time, true believers. True believers.